Okay guys, after some technical difficulties, we've got it figured out. Apparently having a tripod is a little bit too fancy for me. All right, so we're back for another social distancing story time. The kids are finishing up lunch and then my assistants will be in here to help. So we're starting to run low on books. We may have to start getting creative um, in another week or so about how we're gonna keep this up. All right, we're gonna start today with The Story of Ferdinand by Monroe Leaf. This one has been a very favorite of Eve's for bedtime for the past month or so. We love this one. And I think this used to be my mother, the girl's grandmother's favorite when she was a kid. Okay. Once upon a time in Spain, there was a little bull and his name was Ferdinand. All the other little bulls he lived with would run and jump and butt their heads together. But not Ferdinand. He liked to sit just quietly and smell the flowers. He had a favorite spot out in the pasture under a cork tree. It was his favorite tree and he would sit in its shade all day and smell the flowers. Sometimes his mother, who was a cow, would worry about him. She was afraid he would be lonesome all by himself. Why don't you run and play with the other little bulls and skip and butt your head, she would say. But Ferdinand would shake his head. I like it better here where I can sit just quietly and smell the flowers. His mother saw that he was not lonesome and because she was an understanding mother, she let him just sit there and be happy. As the years went by, Ferdinand grew and grew until he was very big and strong. All the other bulls who had grown up with him in the same pasture would fight each other all day. They would butt each other and stick each other with their horns. What they wanted most of all was to be picked to fight at the bullfights in Madrid. But not Ferdinand. He liked to sit just quietly under the cork tree and smell the flowers. One day, five men came in very funny hats to pick the biggest, fastest, and roughest bull to fight in the bullfights in Madrid. All the other bulls ran around snorting and butting, leaping and jumping, so the men would think that they were very, very strong and fierce and pick them. You see the men looking at the bulls? Ferdinand knew that they wouldn't pick him and he didn't care. So he went to his favorite cork tree to sit down. He didn't look where he was sitting and instead of sitting on the nice cool grass in the shade, he sat on a bumblebee. Well, if you were a bumblebee and a bull sat on you, what would you do? You would sting him. And that's just what this bee did to Ferdinand. Yeah. Wow, did it hurt! Ferdinand jumped up with a snort. He ran around puffing and snorting, butting and pawing the ground as if he were crazy. The five men saw him and they all shouted with joy. Here was the largest and fiercest bull of all, just the one for the bullfights in Madrid. So they took him away for the bullfight day in a cart. What a day it was. Flags were flying, bands were playing. And all the lovely ladies had flowers in their hair. Can you see? There's a lady in the flowers. There's a lady, there's a lady. There are so many flowers, it's almost hard to see the ladies. They had a parade into the bull ring. First came the banderilleros with long sharp pins with ribbons on them to stick in the bull and make him mad. 
Next came the picadors, who rode skinny horses, and they had long spears to stick in the bull and make him madder. Then came the matador, the proudest of all. He thought he was very handsome and bowed to the ladies. He had a red cape and a sword and was supposed to stick the bull last of all. Then came the bull, and you know who that was, don't you? Ferdinand. They called him Ferdinand the Fierce, and the banderilleros were afraid of him, and the picadors were afraid of him, and the matador was scared stiff. Does that matador look scared? Oh. Ferdinand ran to the middle of the ring, and everyone shouted and clapped because they thought he was going to fight fiercely and butt and snort and stick his horns around. What do you think? But not Ferdinand. When he got to the middle of the ring, he saw the flowers in all the lovely lady's hair, and he just sat down quietly and smelled. He wouldn't fight and be fierce no matter what they did. He just sat and smelled. And the banderilleros were mad, and the picadors were madder, and the matador was so mad he cried. Because he couldn't show off with his cape and sword. So, they had to take Ferdinand home. And for all I know, he is sitting there still, under his favorite cork tree, smelling the flowers just quietly. He is very happy. Doesn't he look happy? All right, here's the next one, but not The Hippopotamus by Sandra Boynton. Switch sides. Give my arm a rest. A hog and a frog cavort in the bog, but not the hippopotamus. A cat and two rats are trying on hats, but not the hippopotamus. A moose and a goose together have juice, but not the hippopotamus. A bear and a hare have been to a fair, but not the hippopotamus. Now the hog and the frog hurry out for a jog with the cat and the rats in their new running hats. While the moose and the bear and the goose and the hare are doing their best to keep up with the rest, but not the hippopotamus. Then the animal pack comes scurrying back saying, hey, come join the lot of us. And she just doesn't know. Should she stay? Should she go? But yes, the hippopotamus. Oh, but not the armadillo. All right, get ready for some bad British accent. Here it comes, The Tale of Squirrel Nutkin by Beatrix Potter. This is a tale about a tale, a tale that belonged to a little red squirrel, and his name was Notkin. He had a brother called Tinkleberry, and a great many cousins. They lived in a wood at the edge of a lake. In the middle of the lake, there is an island covered with trees and nut bushes, and amongst those trees stands a hollow oak tree, which is the house of an owl who is called Old Brown. One autumn, when the nuts were ripe, and the leaves on the hazel bushes were golden and green, Nutkin and Twinkleberry and all the other little squirrels came out of the wood and down to the edge of the lake. They made little rafts out of twigs and they paddled away over the water to Owl Island to gather nuts. Each squirrel had a little sack and a large oar and, a sp and spread out his tail for a sail. Well, wasn't that creative? They also took with them an offering of three fat mice as a present for Old Brown and put them down upon his doorstep. Then Twinkleberry and the other little squirrels each made a low bow and said politely, Oh, Mr. Brown, would you favor us with permission to gather nuts upon your island? But Nutkin was excessively impertinent in his manners. He bobbed up and down like a little red cherry singing, Riddle me, riddle me, 
rot tot toot, a little wee man in a little red coat, a staff in his hand and a stone on his throat. If you'll tell me this riddle, I'll give you a groat. Now this riddle is as old as the hills. Mr. Brown paid no attention what happened to Natkin. He shut his eyes and obstinately went to sleep. The squirrels filled their little sacks with nuts and sailed away home in the evening. But next morning they all came back again at Owl Island and Twinkleberry and the others brought a fat, fine mole, laid it on the stone in front of old Mr. Brown's doorway and said, Mr. Brown, will you favor us with your gracious permission to gather some more nuts? But Nutkin, who had no respect, began to dance up and down, tickling old Mr. Brown with a nettle and singing, Old Mr. B, riddle me re, hitty pity within the wall, hitty pity without the wall, if you touch hitty pity, hitty pity will bite you. Mr. Brown woke up suddenly and carried the mole into his house. He shut the door in Nutkin's face. Presently, a little thread of blue smoke from a wood fire came up from top of the tree, and Nutkin peeped through the keyhole and sang, A house full, a hole full, and you cannot gather a bowl full. He's being kind of naughty, isn't he? The squirrels searched for nuts all over the island and filled their little sacks, but Nutkin gathered oak apples, yellow and scarlet, and sat upon a beech stump playing marbles and watching the door of old Mr. Brown. On the third day, the squirrels got up very early and went fishing. They caught seven fat minnows as a present for old Brown. They paddled over the lake and landed under a crooked chestnut tree on Owl Island. Twinkleberry and six other little squirrels each carried a fat minnow, but Nutkin, who had not nice manners, brought no present at all. He ran in front singing, the man in the wilderness said to me, How many strawberries in the sea? I answered him, as I thought good, as many red herrings as grow in the wood. But old Mr. Brown took no interest in riddles, not even when the answer was provided for him. On the fourth day, the squirrels brought a present of six fat beetles, which were as good as plums in plum pudding for old Brown. Each beetle was wrapped up carefully in a dock leaf, fastened with a pine needle pin. But Nutkin sang as rudely as ever. Old Mr. B, riddle me re. Ah, uh, flower of England, fruit of Spain, met together in a shower of rain, put in a bag tied round with a string. If you'll tell me this riddle, I'll give you a ring. Which was ridiculous of Nutkin, because he had not got any ring to give to Old Brown. Yeah, that was the ridiculous part of the riddle. The other squirrels hunted up and down the nut bushes, but Nutkin gathered Robin's pin cushions off a briar bush and stuck them full of pine needle pins. That seems a silly thing to do. On the fifth day, the squirrels brought a present of wild honey. It was so sweet and sticky that they licked their fingers as they put it down upon the stone. They had stolen it out of a bumblebee's nest on the tippity top of the hill. But Nutkin skipped up and down singing, hum a bum buzz buzz, hum a bum buzz. I went over Tippletine. I met a flock of bonny swine, some yellow back, uh, some yellow knacked, some yellow backed. They were the very bonniest swine that e'er went over the tipple time. Old Mr. Brown turned up his eyes in disgust at the impertinence of Nutkin, but he ate up the honey. The squirrels filled their little sacks with nuts, but Nutkin sat upon a big flat rock and played nine pins with a crab apple and green fir cones. On the sixth day, which was Saturday, the squirrels came again for the last time. They brought a new laid egg in a little rush basket as a last parting present for Old Brown. But Nutkin ran in front, laughing and shouting, Humpty Dumpty lies in the back with a white counterpane round his neck. Forty doctors and forty rights cannot put Humpty Dumpty to rights. Now Old Brown took an interest in eggs. He opened one eye and shut it again, but still did not speak. Nutkin became more and more impertinent. Old Mr. B, old Mr. B, Hickamore, Hackamore on the king's kitchen door, all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't drive Hickamore, Hackamore off the king's kitchen door. Nutkin danced up and down like a sunbeam, but still old Brown said nothing at all. Nutkin began again. Arthur O'Bower has broken his band. He comes roaring up the land. The King of Scots, with all his power, cannot turn Arthur of the Bower. 
Nutkin made a whirring noise to sound like the wind, and he took a running jump right in the head of Old Brown. Then all at once there was a flutterment and a scufflement and a loud squeak. The other squirrels scattered away into the bushes. When they came back, very cautiously peeping round the tree, there was Old Brown sitting on his doorstep, quite still with his eyes closed as if nothing had happened. But Nutkin was in his waistcoat pocket. This looks like the end of the story, but it isn't. Old Brown carried Natkin into his house and held him up by the tail, intending to skin him, but Natkin pulled so very hard that his tail broke in two and he dashed up the staircase and escaped out of the attic window. And to this day, if you meet Natkin up a tree and ask him a riddle, he will throw sticks at you and stamp his feet and scold and shout, The end. Okay, I Love You Through and Through by Bernadette Rossetti Schustack, illustrated by Carolyn Jane Church. I love you through and through. I love your top side. I love your bottom side. I love your inside and outside. I love your happy side, your sad side. Hmm. Your silly side, your mad side. I love your fingers and toes. I love your ears and nose. I love your hair and eyes. I love your giggles and cries. I love you running, but not in the house, <laughs> and walking. Silent, which is never, and talking. I love you through and through. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow too. Pearl by Molly Idol. Up, oh, it's another upside down book. Oh, put this book jacket on. Probably the two-year-old. In the vast sea of blue, some mermaids watched over the waves breaking upon the endless beaches. Some kept an eye on the great coral reefs. Some tended to the towering forests of kelp rising from the ocean floor. Some guarded the giants of the deep, is that an octopus? And Pearl deeply yearned to be one of them. Little Pearl over here. Mother, am I big enough to help too, she said. Yes, Pearl, her mother considered, come with me. I have something very important for you to look after. They swam up and up and up. Past the breaking waves until the sandy shore stretched all around them. This, said her mother, is yours. She placed a single grain of sand teeny tiny, into Pearl's hand. Yours to care for every day and keep safe every night. But mother protested, Pearl, you said I could help with something important. The smallest of things can make a great difference, Pearl, her mother replied. With that, Pearl was left alone. A wave of disappointment washed over her. She was surrounded by thousands of grains of sand, millions, billions, beyond counting. And here she was entrusted with just one. Her heart grew heavy, and the weight of it pulled her down, down, down. 
where the salt of her tears mingled with the sea. Pearl glowered at the grain of sand. She clenched it in her tiny fist. Then from beneath her fingers came a faint light. But when Pearl opened her hand, it was gone. Pearl closed her hand around the tiny grain again, gently this time. The sand resting on her palm had a luster to it that had not been there before. Every day, Pearl preserved it, polished it, and played with it. Every night, she protected it, and slowly, very slowly, it began to grow and grow and grow. And as it grew lighter, so did Pearl's heart. It seemed to bowie them up and up and up. until it rose into the vast sea of stars. Pearl beamed up at it. It beamed back. Its light touched everything. It sparkled on the breaking waves and the coral creating new reefs. It glowed in the tides flowing through the towering forests and illuminated the giants rising from the deep. Do you see the tentacles? And it shone upon Pearl. See, even the smallest things can make a big difference. Hey, Stasha, are you done, honey? No. Could you hop in here for just one minute? Because I have a special book for you. So this is a book that Stasha got as a birthday present. Actually, right when she name. was born. Because that's your name. Come sit over here with me, dude. So the words are by David Kaji Newby. And it's illustrated by Pedro Serapicos. The girl who lost her name. What girl? What name did she lose? Don't Stop. ruin it. Let's find out. It starts with the S. Mm -hmm. That's the only clue I can give you. That's a good clue. If I can get the first page open. Okay, I got it. Starts with the S, ends with the A. Starts with an S and ends with an A. All right, let's check it out. One morning, a little girl awoke, sat up, and rubbed her eyes. Looked over at her bedroom door and got a nasty surprise. Her name, which she had stuck there, shock horror, it was gone. What was her name? Was it Jane or Sam or Rebecca or Yvonne? Hmm. No luck. Her name had vanished. She couldn't find it anywhere. So she put on some clothes, brushed her teeth, and even combed her hair. It's big doings in this house. And set off to find her name, never mind the dangers, for it's true that this little girl was ever so courageous. She crept out into the dawn and discovered a winding trail. Would she find her name? Let's find out. On with our tail. What's on the trail? A, B, C, D, E, F, G. H. Is that the alphabet? Mm-hmm. All right. But the sea, the little girl, by the sea, the little girl walked and came across a rock pool and heard a voice cry out, Oh my, I'm tangled something awful. She stopped and looked and saw a creature looking most disgruntled with lots and lots of tentacles all wrapped up in a jumble. Oh dear, the little girl said, what happened? It does look pretty bad. I was doing my times tables, it said, using my arms to add. I'd only got to nine when I found myself in this dreadful muddle. Don't worry, the girl said, unpicking the knot. This will be a doddle. My name's Squid, the creature said as the girl pulled with all her might. I don't know my name, the girl grunted. It disappeared last night. Oh my goodness, you've lost your name? 
the squid exclaimed, aghast. And with that, the little girl undid the knot, freeing the tentacles at last. Oh, thank you, the creature cried, fishing something from the deep. An ass for squid made from coral, and it's yours to keep. Hmm. That's an interesting letter, isn't it? S. Mm-hmm. See, it, it starts to say, it starts with an S. Hmm. Let's see. Over a bridge, the little girl crossed a wide and frothing river, but halfway across, a terrible cry made her stop and shiver. Who dares go there? Bellowed out a short, fat, hairy troll. I'm afraid you've chosen the wrong place to enjoy a morning stroll. I, I'm sorry, stammered the girl, who'd been given quite a fright. But have you seen my name? Only I lost track of it last night. You've lost your name, you say? Good gracious, goyosh. The troll spoke like this because he was really rather posh. My name's Troll, he puffed proudly, which starts with the letter T. Look like this one on my necklace. Take it, please. Feel free. Oh, thank you, the little girl said. If you're sure that you don't mind, I had heard that trolls were horrid, but you're really very kind. The troll coughed <clears throat> in embarrassment and scuttled back to his lair. Run along now, he said gruffly. I've got lots of people to scare. Hmm. On and on, the little girl walked here and there and round about till she came across an animal with a curiously long snout. Hello, the little girl said politely. What kind of animal are you? Aardvark. I'm an aardvark, said the beast. Pleased to meet you. How do you do? Not good, the little girl said dolefully. I'm hungry and I've lost my name. Oh, goodness, cried the aardvark. Bless my soul, what a dreadful shame. The aardvark was rooting busily, nose down among the plants. He said, would you care to join me for a tasty plate of ants? Ants, said the little girl, pulling a face. Uh, oh no, really, not for me. And sat down looking so gloomy that the aardvark took pity. Lost your name? He snuffled gently. Well, now that won't do. But there's no need for you to give up and sit there feeling blue. Aardvark starts with two A's, so I can surely spare you one. I'm sure you'll come across your name before the day is done. The little girl had walked for miles and sat down on a rock, which cried out, Ow, you're squashing me! giving her a nasty shock. The girl jumped up, and there below was a creature now turned blue. Why'd you sit on me? It asked. I'm a chameleon, not a pew. Sorry, said the little girl, but you were gray a second ago. In fact, you looked exactly like a rock. How was I to know? Aha, the chameleon crowd pr cried proudly. How'd you like my trick? Blue, red, yellow, gray, a pink. I can disguise myself in a tick. You're lucky, said the girl. I wish I could stay the same. You can be anything you want. I don't even have a name. No name, replied the chameleon. Well, that's a bit of a blow. But maybe I can help you out before you have to go. Here's a C for chameleon. It was a present from my brother. Take it with you, please. It's really not my color. Hmm. S-T-A-C. I wonder what we're spelling. The weather had just turned chilly, which wasn't very nice, when the girl spied a man fishing through a hole cut in the ice. Oh, fish, the man sighed sadly. I'm at the very end of my tether, and I'm absolutely freezing. Oh, curse this dreadful weather. I belong to the Inuit, he said. We're supposed to love the snow. But do I look like I'm enjoying myself? The answer's a big N-O. No. I just want to chill out on a beach and get a smashing tan. Well, I just want to find my name, said the girl. That is, if I can. And they both stared into the icy hole and they both shed a tear. Then the girl said, I've heard grease is nice this time of year. Grease, you say? The Inuit man cried. Then I'm on the next plane out. But, oh, you've still not found your name. I'd love to help you out. 
Take this icicle, shaped like an eye, for Inuit, you see. I'm off to white sand beaches and barbecued prawns for tea. S-T-A-C-I. Hmm. On the top of a hill, the little girl came across a fluffy cloud, with a young lady lying on top, grumbling to herself out loud. Are you okay? the girl asked. Only I couldn't help but hear, No, I am not okay, she snapped. In fact, I've had it up to here. I'm an angel, or I'm supposed to be, but it's really not for me. Well, I've lost my name, the girl replied and sighed unhappily. All this, the angel said, ignoring her. The halo, the cloud, the frock. It's all so good and wholesome, but I really just want to rock. Make loud music, have big hair, and stay up till way past dark. I already know how to play rock songs right here on this harp. Why can't angels rock? The girl asked. I don't see what's so bad. No, the angel replied. That's true. It's not like it's been banned. You're right, she said. Why ever not? And she clapped her hands in joy. Take this A for angel for your name. I'm off to make some noise. The little girl turned around and skipped back the way she'd come, past all the wonderful sights she'd seen and all the things she'd done. The letters she'd been given. Can you guess what they spelled out? That's right. The name she thought she'd lost. She'd found it again, no doubt. Yippee, the girl cried happily. Hooray, never say never. Oh, that was the best adventure any girl has had ever. Up the winding trail, she walked and crept back to her house into her bed and under the covers as quiet as a mouse. She felt so tired and weary, her head one happy whirl. What a quite amazingly brave and courageous little girl called... Stasha, which called, is my name. Called, I have a giant bite of sandwich in my <laughs> mouth. McGee, is that your name? No. Oh. All right, come here. Cool? Was that cool? Yeah. All right, dude. That's it for today, you guys. Thanks for joining us for another lunchtime virtual social distancy story time. We'll see you again tomorrow. Why do we only do some? Why do we only do some? Because people only have so much of an attention span. We'll pick some more for tomorrow, though, okay? All right. Thanks, guys. Bye.